Happy Veterans Day. We are here at Patriots Point Naval and Maritime Museum in Mount Pleasant across the harbor from beautiful Charleston, South Carolina. We are on the Yorktown. This is a World War II, Cold War, Vietnam era aircraft carrier. Weighs in at 41,000 tons, fully loaded, 3,500 men, eating four tons of food a day. That's more than your family did at the last family reunion. <laughs> I call it the backbone of the ship. We have over 100 volunteers that are working here each and every day, week, month, throughout the year. And we could not do what we do without them. I want to introduce to you one of the greatest and most humble volunteers that we have on the ship, Tom Simons. Morning, Al. Thanks for inviting me. Appreciate Morning, it. Morning, Tom. A lot of times we're asked the question, Veterans Day and Memorial Day, what is the real difference? Well, Memorial Day, think of memory, memorial. And that's where we remember those who have died in the cause of protecting freedom and liberty within our country. That is a holiday in the month of May. Veterans Day is always 11-11, November the 11th. While we honor those who died in the service protecting us Memorial Day, Veterans Day we honor the living, those who are still serving or have served. And today we have a veteran with us, Tom Simons. And Tom, I'm just going to ask you, what does Veterans Day mean to you personally? Well. My grandfather served in World War I, was a, a railroad engineer in France. My father was a tail gunner in B-17s and B-24s in World War II. My mother served in the Women's Army Corps as a nurse during World War II. And I had two other uncles and an aunt who also served during World War II. None of my family members served during the Korean War, but I began my service in 1967 during the Vietnam War. My wife is also a Navy veteran, and my son is an active duty Air Force pilot today. So Veterans Day really means a lot to me and my family as it does millions of other Americans. It is a very, very important day. I have a question for you, Tom. What exactly did you do 30 years in the Navy? And I know you were part of a very elite uh, group of aviators. Can you just explain a little bit about what you did before we go up to the flight deck? Well, Al. The Navy trained me to be an aviation structural mechanic. My specialty was hydraulics. I worked on numerous kinds of airplanes throughout my career, including the one we're gonna see on the flight deck, the F-4 Phantom. There are currently five aircraft on Yorktown that were flown by the Blue Angels. The F-6F Hellcat, the F-9 Cougar, the A-4 Skyhawk, the F-4 Phantom, and the F-18 Hornet. Tom, thanks a lot. What do you say we go topside, take a look at that F-4 Phantom? Sounds good to me, let's go. Let's go. Tom, this is one of my favorite places on the ship, up here on the flight deck, overlooking Charleston. But you served with the Blue Angels. I guess you called them the Blues. The Blues, yes, sir. What is the purpose, really, of the Blue Angels, number one? And number two, what did you, in particular, do while you were serving with the Blue Angels? The Blue Angels are the, actually the Navy's top recruiting tool. If you stop and think about it, if you live in San Diego or Norfolk or on either one of the coasts, you can see a lot of Navy ships and the Navy is not an unfamiliar sight to you. But if you live in Lincoln, Nebraska or Bozeman, Montana, the Navy is kind of a foreign thing to you. The Navy uses the Blue Angels to go around the country and demonstrate the capabilities that the Navy has, even though it's just the aviation arm, it draws interest. The recruiters use them as a recruiting tool to entice young men and women to uh, find a career or at least a short-term uh, stint with, with the Navy. While I was in the Blue Angels, I was a crew chief. The, the airplane behind me is, uh, is the standard fleet gray airplane. Uh, the Blue Angel airplane are shiny blue airplanes with gold lettering, and they are the, they are the best. When I was selected to join the Blue Angels, it was one of the greatest treats of my life to think that they considered me to be worthy uh, of an opportunity to do that. Once I got there, I kind of realized that I had to step up my game because everybody there was the best of the best. So I served as a crew chief, and every morning we came out 
check the airplanes over, make sure they were properly fueled, oiled and serviced and ready to go for the day's flight demonstration. One final touch up with the red rag to make sure they were shiny and clean. And then we launched the airplanes for the afternoon demonstration. Now, Tom, that's fantastic. I was not in the Vietnam War, but I remember watching TV and the news, and all I saw was F-4s, F-4s, F-4s. They were the real workhorse of the Vietnam War when it came to fighters. Well, we're going to leave the flight deck now in the jets. We're going to go down below to the hangar deck and look at a prop plane that served in World War II called the Hellcat. Another number one fighter in its day. That's right. We're now on the hangar deck. We're right below the flight deck. This is the main deck. And as you look at this deck, remember this aircraft carrier is three football fields long. Basically, the hangar deck was the garage. This is where they stored them. This is where they maintained them. And we want to look particularly at this plane, the Hellcat. Guess what kind of plane was the first plane to land on this ship? You're right, it was the Hellcat. This plane was the premier fighter off of carriers in World War II. This was a fantastic aircraft. But how does it compare to the Phantom, the F-4 that we just saw? Mr. Tom, I'm gonna to have you come in and just, in a few words, how do these two planes compare with each other? The Hellcat was the top fighter of its time. It, uh, and the Phantom was the top fighter of its time, the Vietnam era. The propeller-driven Hellcat uh, primary weapon system was guns. It also had just one pilot. The Phantom, as we saw upstairs, had a crew of two. Its primary uh, weapon system was missiles. The Hellcat is capable of about 380 miles an hour top end. The Phantom is capable, because of its jet engines, of about 1,200 miles per hour. Uh, this is, was the first aircraft that the Blue Angels flew starting back in 1946. The Phantom, as we talked about earlier, was the airplane that the uh, Blue Angels flew from 1969 to 1973. Thank you, Tom. Before we leave the Hellcat, I've got to tell you a story because the Hellcat on this ship has a real story behind it, and there's a man behind that story. In fact, if you look down here, you can see Bill's bench. And a lot of times people come and say, Bill's bench, who's Bill? Well, interesting. Bill is now 98 years old. In January, he'll be 99. He lives up in New Jersey. Up until about a year ago, he was on this ship three or four times a week, sitting on this bench, talking about all these planes with props because he flew most of them. Bill is one of only two of our World War II veterans who volunteer regularly for Patriots Point who served on the USS Yorktown CVT. Back in 1945, Bill Watkinson flew the Hellcats off of the Yorktown. Right now he's in New Jersey. If he were here, he'd be sitting right here talking to the visitors, and he would love to tell you about the Hellcat and his experiences. So it's personal. The Hellcat and the Yorktown very personal. Today we have a real treat. Did not plan this for Veterans Day, but uh, this is a real treat. We have a veteran that served on this ship on the Yorktown from 1963 to 64. His name is Larry, Mr. Larry from West Virginia. So what was your duty on the ship when you were assigned to the Yorktown? I was in operations department and I worked in the operations office as a yeoman, which is a clerk typist. And we did all the, uh, fixed up all the messages that went out to all the officers, captain of the ship and the, uh, uh, the uh, airplane for the airplanes for the day of what they're going to fly. We would deliver those, type those up and deliver them to the captain and the executive officer. What was the noise level? when you were on this ship. Was it pretty quiet or was it pretty loud? It was loud. <laughs> it was loud to go from zero to 10, it was plus 10. Well, what was so loud about it? Was it the elevator well, here? The, the elevator and then they, and they had all the planes parked here. And they had them run. This is the garage. They kept them running. They didn't, didn't turn them off. Because if they turned them off, then it would take 
uh, a long time to start them up and get them warmed back up so they could go. So let's help them run. And it would get real noisy here. And then when they was going to fly one, they'd put it on the elevator, take it up to the flight deck, and they'd use a catapult to shoot it off. Right. They shot them off because the flight deck wasn't long enough to take them unless they shot them. And then when they, when they come in and landed, they'd come in and they had a cable, and they had a hook on the back of the plane, that cable would catch them in that hook. Yep. Keep them, keep them Rester going cable, yeah. tail hook. Yeah. Now, is this the first time back on the ship since 64? Yes, it is. How did you feel when you came and stepped back on this ship for the first time? <laughs> I almost cried. I had to uh, run chills all over me because I tell you, this brings back a lot of memories, a whole lot of, of, of good memories. And I've uh, been wanting to come for a long time, never could make it, but here I am. We thank you for your service to thank our you. country, and it's so good to have you here. Thank you. Uh, and you didn't know you were going to be filmed. No, I, I didn't know. You're I'm preserved going to, now forever. I didn't know I was going to be a movie star. <laughs> thank you much. Thank you. Man. Never before have these huge planes been launched from a carrier. Okay, we have a question that's asked quite often. Why do we have an army bomber on a naval ship? Very interesting, and there's a reason and it goes back to the Doolittle Raid of April 1942. This is the type of aircraft that was used in the Doolittle Raid. We're gonna talk more about that as we go around now on the other side of the aircraft. Now remember your history. December the 7th, 1941, bombing at Pearl Harbor. Japanese touched us with their bombs. Morale in the US was extremely low. So what did we do? We did something the Japanese never thought we would do. On April the 18th, 1942, about four months after Pearl Harbor, we put 16 of these B-25s on an aircraft carrier Hornet, smaller than New Yorktown, for a one-way ride to Tokyo and surrounding area to bomb them. It sent a message to Japan we can reach you as well. Didn't do a lot of damage, but it was uh, symbolic in the sense that it, it communicated to them that they're vulnerable, and it certainly lifted the morale here in the US. Just want to mention Lieutenant Horace Crouch, crew number 10. Since we live in Charleston, he has a real significance. He's a Citadel graduate, class of 1940. I'm a Citadel graduate, class of 1973. So of the 80 men, 16 aircraft, five crew on each one, we have one man representing the Citadel class of 1940, Lieutenant Horace Crouch. I wanna talk just a moment about crew number seven, piloted by Ted Lawson. Ted wrote a book called 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. Some of you might remember that. Then later on a movie. So he was there. What happened though in training, practice, they took off one day at a steep angle and they scraped the tail of their plane. So somebody wrote on the fuselage in chalk, ruptured duck. Ted turned to his gunner and said, hey, can you get a picture of Donald Duck, couple crutches, earphones, and uh, make a, some kind of a symbol out of that? This is army art and what you have is a picture of the ruptured duck, plane number seven. We don't have any of the aircraft from the original uh, flight. They're all crash landed. This plane was built in 1944. It is a real World War II medium bomber. It has been made to look like Ted Lawson's plane, the ruptured duck. We uh, are done out here. Let's take a look on the inside of the aircraft. Okay, now we're coming up inside the B-25. This is a medium bomber, and you can tell there's not a whole lot of room. You had to get 16 of these on an aircraft carrier Hornet smaller than New Yorktown, so they couldn't be huge. Five-man crew, pilot, co-pilot, navigator, bombardier, and a gunner. 
This opening was not here originally. It was made basically for tourists so that we could move visitors in and out. But behind me is the turret and the twin 50 caliber machine guns. Here I am in the turret with the twin 50 calibers. Of course, this was used to shoot down enemy airplanes. Interesting fact, if you see pictures of the Doodle Raid, you'll see that there are tail guns, but really there's no tail guns. To save weight, they took the guns out, took broomsticks and painted them black. So the Japanese thought we had machine guns. This was great. Always working with you is a great experience. I hope it was educational. I know I learned a lot because you're like a walking encyclopedia when it comes to these things. 30 years in the Navy working Blue Angels. Hope it was inspirational too for all you folks listening out there and the, the kids in the schools and libraries. Enjoy your Veterans Day. Happy Veterans Day. And if you see a vet, make sure you walk up to them and say, Thank you for your service. Give them a fist pump. And uh, we are so appreciative of our vets. Thanks uh, for giving me this opportunity, Al. I had a great time. Oh, it was a great time. When you come to the Yorktown now, you're going to walk on history. You're going to smell history. You're going to touch history. You're going to experience history. And I hope you leave loving history. You love the veterans. And you love our country. You guys have a good one now. We'll see you.